Father, we love you today. We honor you. We adore you. We praise and worship you in this, your house of meeting. May faith arise in our hearts today because of the word of God. Because of the prayers of the saints. Both in-house and online, would you captivate our thoughts? Would you begin to help us to pull down strongholds? To walk in the authority that you've given us? Lord, today, wash us with your presence. From the youngest to the oldest in this room and around the world, watching now and watching later, Lord, would you just get so much glory that you are so pleased to dwell amongst us that you just move. And Father, as we're going to see here in your word, we thank you that in every situation and on every occasion, you always have the final word. And we honor you and praise you for that. The grass withers and the flower thereof fadeth away, but the word of our God abides forever. Thy word, O Lord, is settled in heaven. And we thank you that it'll never be altered by man. So be pleased to dwell amongst us for these moments we have. In the mighty name of Jesus and the church, shout it out. Amen and amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you're still being dealt with and prayed for, that's understandable. We're not going to rush you back to your seat. But if you're able to, you can head back to your seat for a few moments. I want to invite you as we take our text in the book of Matthew chapter 4 this morning. The book of Matthew and the fourth chapter. Now, we've already prayed, and so in a moment, we're just going to, to jump fantastically right into the text. Now, I'm not exactly sure how long I will be in this text. I do want to pronounce and explain it well, but expositionally, uh, I'm on a mission today from the Holy Spirit that I'm, I'm not just going to stay here verse by verse the entirety of the time because there's a lot of Bible that I want to develop over the course of the next few moments. If you take notes, number one, today would be perhaps a good day to do that, but perhaps maybe not so good of a day because I'm going to move quickly because I think it's important that I do so, not just because we're under some sort of time constraint that we're not under, but I have so much to share with you. I want to stay focused by faith on the power and the authority of God's Word. Now, that being said, before I read and take the text in Matthew chapter 4, most of you know that I'm a very extemporaneous communicator. Meaning by that, most everything I do and say comes from the overflow of my study. God's given me a steel trap of a memory, and so I'm just able to say and quote things just uh, as I need to, as the recall comes to me from the Holy Spirit. But sometimes I've, I've got to write things down because there's more there that needs to be developed, if that makes sense. So I have literally chicken scratched on about five different pieces of paper this morning. And for a guy that never follows an outline, only follows the text, it's a bit daunting for me to make sure I stay in order. But how many of you know if you'll walk in God's order, he'll make sure it all comes out the way it's supposed to come out? Because I quit preaching cute sermons a long time ago. It, didn't, it never matters who shows up and how many cameras are here? We're going to be global vision because that's who God called us to be. So I woke up this morning and I was fully intending to go another direction in another passage, in another story. And the Lord said, I know you have an interview this morning and it's going to take a bit of your time. And I know you're not prepared to do this, but I'm prepared. So when you get done, I want you to stay in that office, drink some coffee, and I want you to get some scrap pieces of paper and an ink pen and start writing as quick as I tell you to. So I did. So I started chicken scratching everything I could think of that God brought to my heart and God brought to my mind. And I'm going to use it today, and we're going to go on a journey through the Bible. I think it's important. 
You, you can't read as much Bible as our church has been reading and not absorb it and also not be convicted at the lack of authority that we walk in. Me and Pastor Jesse were talking just the other day. I, I think one of the great problems, if not the greatest problem, in the American church from the standpoint of a pastor is we have pastors and churches that have influence but no authority. You can have a blue check mark and bust hell wide open. You can be a well-known church and have great religious and political influence, but God did not empower us with influence. He equipped us with authority. So today we're going to go on an authoritative journey in the word of God. I may get so ahead of myself or so far behind myself that my tongue might get wrapped around my eye teeth and I can't even see where I'm going, but I'm going to give it a whirl because God told me to. And we're going to let the Bible be the Bible in this tent today. So go to Matthew chapter 4, if you would, and we're going to read a very familiar story, and it's going to be the launching pad for a journey, especially through the context of the Old Testament that we're going to take for just a moment. Because how many of you know that discouragement is a reality? That problems are reality. That a lack of finances in your life is a reality. That prodigal children are reality. That people turning on you are reality. That schisms in your marriage are reality. That cancer is a reality. How many of you know that the enemy has the loudest whispers on the planet? You can be in your room all by yourself and the enemy begins to whisper and it sounds like it's been accentuated with a megaphone in your heart. And one of the great tools and tactics of the enemy and his kingdom is this. To make you think that what you're struggling with and walking through is way bigger than it actually is. Because the enemy is mouthy. He uses a lot of words. But today on the authority of the word of God, I'm going to preach on this very simplistic subject. God will always have the last word. And I'm going to prove that to you from the Bible. Look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. <coughs> then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Theologically, we understand that this just historically took place moments after his public baptism. And although it's not what I'm preaching on, hear me and hear me well. The very second... You go public in your relationship to God, you better know the devil is going to come after you. You see, there's a lot of churches that say, well, you know, we just don't experience what y'all's church experiences. We never see demons flare up. It's not my fault your pastor don't have enough authority to make the devil mad when he's preaching the Bible. That's not on me, that's on him. So Jesus is in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil and watch what happens in verse 2. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, that's a long time to go without food. He was afterward, obviously, in his humanity, hungered. And when the tempter, I find that a very interesting phrase to be used for the devil, the tempter. Because you better know that's exactly what he is and that's exactly what he does. And one of the biggest temptations is to make you think he has more power than he actually does. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And if God be for us, who can be against us? And you better know no matter what they say or do, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That's the facts. And so he's the tempter. And he came to him and he said, if thou be the son of God. You know, that's one of the most interesting and ridiculous things that the devil ever said out of his mouth. He looks at Jesus, who is not just the Son of God, but God the Son. And he says, oh, if you be who you say you are. You ever notice that one of the biggest temptations the devil will ever throw at you is to doubt what God did for you and make you question if you're really a son or daughter of God or not. He did it to Jesus. You better know, if he tried to get Jesus to doubt, 
It's going to be the chief tool in his tackle box to try to get the church in America to doubt what God's already promised that he will do. And Titus 1, 2 says God cannot lie. If God gave you a promise, I don't care if it takes a thousand years to fulfill, he will fulfill his promise every single time because he is a promise-making and promise-keeping God. He's a God of covenant, according to the Bible. So the tempter said, if you are who you say you are, Command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written. It is written. Would you out loud say that phrase? Here we go. It say it one more time. It Notice what Jesus did not do. He did not philosophically sit down on a stool and say, Let me scientifically, mathematically talk to you from a biological standpoint. Jesus did not try to reason with the devil. Because the devil does things for no reason. Just because he's the devil. And we have been taught that what we ought to do is try to carry on a logical conversation with the things that come into our life when the best thing you can do is the only thing Jesus did. Stand up, bow your back, and simply say, shh, shh, it is written. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. How do you take your thoughts captive? By submitting them to the authority of the word of God, because if God said it, it's done. There's a bumper sticker that's been floating around for years. I pray you don't have it. If you do, you can peel it off when we're done. But it says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You better take that middle phrase out because God said it and that settles it whether you believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen. The power of the word of God is not predicated on my belief. It's on me if I don't believe it, but you better know this. It's on God that he said it. And you can always take God at his word because God is a perfect supernatural gentleman. So he says, it is written, devil man. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, that's important, that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus is now going to go to the importance of the Old Testament, as we're about to do. And he is going to literally take the book of Deuteronomy on three occasions and obliterate the theology of the devil. And I use my phrase correctly because you better know the devil is more theological than all of us combined in this room. He knows the Bible. That's why his design and desire is to keep you from reading it because he don't know what you know in the Bible. Because demons know you have authority. They just hope you don't know you have authority. Because when the word of God begins to infiltrate your system and your mind and your marriage and your house and your kids and your body, you then become a supernatural weapon and tool in the hands of a thrice holy God. And the devil knows when you start living an it is written life, it is done for him. He knows that. So it's not just about a Bible reading marathon. Let's see how fast we can read it. Oh, no, no. It's a Bible obeying marathon. Let's see how fast we can obey what the text actually says. It is written. Now, verse 5. Then, once the first challenge is overcome, the devil taketh him up into the holy city. And he setteth him, Jesus, on a pinnacle of the temple. And he saith unto him, If, there it is again, thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, notice what the devil did. Now he's going to get cute and start quoting the Bible because he knows it better than I do. He knows it better than you do. Let me tell you something. American pulpits are filled with suits and ties of people that work for Satan himself. The, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, do not be marveled and bewildered that the angel of light has messengers of darkness that pretend to be messengers of light and they are false prophets deceiving the nations and that's a fact. And it's not going to get better. The Bible says as the world grows colder and darker, it's going to get worse and worse and the only antidote to false prophets and bad theology is to get your nose out of the newspaper and stick it in the Bible so you know what the Bible says. It is written will fix your theological perspective. 
Nobody's ever read the Bible and come out a heretic. Every heretic I've ever argued with and debated talked about what Sister Wigglejaw and Dr. Bottlestopper said about the Bible. You better get in what the Bible says because the Bible will fix your theological position and your disposition. So the devil now starts using the Bible against Jesus. Of course, he misquotes it to some degree. But he says, you, you, you know what the Bible says. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So now the devil's trying to get savvy and use the Bible. But watch this, verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written, again, given in the word of God, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. <clears throat> now listen, I'm going slow on purpose today because I think it's important because we've got a good long journey we're about to take. But I want to say this from a very interesting perspective to fix some bad theology that is out there. People say things like this. Well, you know, the church I grew up in taught me that, yes, Jesus is the Son of God, but he's not God. Let me tell you something. If you deny the deity of Christ, you are not a follower of Christ. The devil began to tempt. And do you know what Jesus said? Jesus who was the one being tempted, said to Satan from the Bible, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Who was Satan in the process of tempting? Jesus. And Jesus, quoting the Bible, said, the word says, you should not tempt the Lord thy God. Thus he was theologically placing himself saying, you are tempting me and breaking an Old Testament covenant because I am the Lord thy God. You better know that. Anybody that denies the deity of Jesus Christ is a heretic. And the Bible says, after you warn them twice, mark them and reject them and don't even go to lunch with them. They're a heretic. And so it's very plain what Jesus is doing here, verse number eight. Again, see, the devil keeps going. He's trying to wear you down because he's been doing that for 20, 30, 40, 50 years of your life, and he knows eventually you'll give up. But when you get to a place where you dig your heels in and start quoting the Bible, he'll leave you alone eventually and go somewhere else because he knows he can't win against the authority that you walk in. That's why you can have a lot of followers on TikTok and not have enough Holy Ghost power to blow the fuzz off a small peanut because the devil ain't afraid about how many people follow you. He's afraid when you follow Jesus. That's what he's afraid of. And so the devil now, verse 8, taketh them into an exceeding high mountain and showeth them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if, there's the if, thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now, people look at this and they're like, he's talking to Jesus. How can he offer that? 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Satan has been given the keys to this world. Revelation 12, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil hath come down unto you having great wrath, knowing that he hath but a short time. He's in control now, but you better know when this thing goes into overtime, he loses and he knows it and he's mad about it. He's trying to drag everybody he can to hell because he knows his sorry car Marcus is going to be there. Revelation chapter 20 teaches. And so Jesus now confronts him once again and says, verse 10, get thee hence, Satan. Why? Because I'm educationally superior to you. No. For it is written. Three times now, Jesus loaded up the gospel gun and shot the devil right in the face with the Bible. Why? Because no matter what the devil tries to stir up, you better know God always gets the last word. And the word was, it is written, it is written, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Now you'll notice what happens next because when the devil gets a snout full of the authority of God's word. 
Even the devil himself can't handle it. He's the second most powerful being in the universe. We don't minimize that, but we maximize that God is greater because Jesus did not say in Matthew 28, some power has been given unto me. Oh no, the devil has some power, but Jesus said all power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. So the devil may have some, but God has the sum total of all of it. And that's the facts if it's ever been told. So it says in verse 11, then, then and only then, when the devil heard Jesus use the final authority of the Bible, then the devil leaveth him. And behold, angels came. I love that. Angels came and ministered unto him. So for just a moment, we're going to historically, prophetically, and theologically take a little bit of a journey through the Old Testament. You see, everybody gets nervous when we start talking about the Old Testament. The sacrificial system makes us nervous, not when you understand that Jesus fulfilled the whole thing. We look at all the names and we think, my goodness, how can you have so many multisyllabic King James names? Does it matter? Every word of God is for our learning and admonition. And every jot and every tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. And every unpronounceable name in the Bible is there for a divine design by the Holy Spirit. So we're going to take a journey. I don't know exactly what the journey is going to look like. I don't exactly get out of it, but I want to show you from the Bible that when the enemy begins to raise up against you the floodwaters of confusion, that God raises up a standard of his word and shuts it down before he drowns you with it. So I want you to maybe in your notes, maybe or maybe not, whatever you want to do, I want you to write maybe like G-E-N for Genesis, and then we're just going to go from there. And we're going to go Exodus. We're not going to turn there. We don't have time for it. But I began to write some things down about when the enemy tried to shut down God's people and shut down the world. When he showed up and started to get nasty. When the devil showed up, started to get mouthy. When the devil said, Woo, I have won. God always has the final word. And we learn that from the word. So in the book of Genesis, when everything was bad and horrendous, and God said, because of the sin of humanity, I am going to destroy man from off the face of the earth. The enemy said, whoo, I finally get to see the DNA of people made in the image of God be completely destroyed and obliterated off of the face of the earth. And the devil says, yes, these people will serve the same fate that me and my fallen servants and angels will serve. God is going to get angry and destroy all of them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And move with fear to the preparing of an ark for the saving of his household. And the Bible says, by him and his children, the whole earth after the flood was overspread. The enemy whispered in the ear of Abraham. I know you and your wife been praying for decades. But you better know that God's not going to fulfill his promise. You barren and dry as a bird's nest, woman. You and your husband shall never bring forth light. And the enemy had them discouraged. But how many of you know God always gets the last word? And God said in Genesis chapter 12, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curseth thee, and your seed shall be as the stars of heaven and as the sand on the seashore. So shall it be done, for thou shalt rule all nations, Abraham. The people of God went into 400 years of cruel bondage. Exodus starts rolling around because it literally means what these signs on this tent mean. It's an exiting. It's a prophetic departure from one spot to the next. 
And there arose a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph in the land and began to beat these people with whips and they became slaves in the nation of Israel for 430 years. And the enemy said to the people of God, you see, God gave you a promise, but look here, it's been 430 years. This promise will not be fulfilled. But the Lord always gets the last word. And Moses walked down in the presence of Aaron, the elders, and Pharaoh, bowed his back like a banny rooster, held up a hickory stump, and said, Let my people go that we may go into the wilderness and worship the Lord God Almighty. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? And Moses said, I'm so glad you brought up that conversation. And after 10 plagues, they escaped. They exited the land of Egypt. Having spoiled the Egyptians, they get to the bank of the Red Sea. There's nowhere to go. You can't get over. You can't get through. You can't get under. You can't get around. And the enemy says, go back to Egypt. Tell Moses he's lost his mind. Go back to Egypt. But how many of you know God always gets the last word? And Moses walked out ankle deep into that water and hiked up his robe, picked up that hickory stick, held it to the heavens and said, be still and see the salvation of our God. For the Egyptians that you see today, you shall see them no more forever, saith the Lord. And God still uses his word to make a way when there is no way. God began to give all these laws in the book of Leviticus and everybody's like, holy smokes, I'll stick with Hebrews. Why do I got to read the book of Leviticus? Two chapters on leprosy, crazy stuff about harlotry and sodomites and a bunch of crazy, don't sleep with this one and don't sleep with that one and dear God, stay away from animals. And you're like, what in the world? And the enemy says, don't read that book. Israel, don't, don't obey all those rules from that big bad bully up in heaven trying to give you a black eye. And everybody's like, I don't understand Leviticus. I don't understand Leviticus. And then how many of you know that the word of God still gets the last word? Because in the midst of reading all that stuff that we don't get, here's what God says. You want to understand the book of Leviticus? It's in one phrase. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And it's still the blood that speaks a better word for his people. Then you get to the book of Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, when everything looked bleak and they're wandering around, meandering like rats in a wheel, God said in Numbers 14, 21, truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. That sounds like good news to me. The people kept meandering and they got into the book of Deuteronomy. And once they got into the book of Deuteronomy, the people were discouraged. They were beat down. The enemy said, you are never going to make it across the Jordan River. You've been that close. You'll never make it. God will never do anything more for you. You are too rebellious. And Moses, under the inspiration of God, looks at the people and says, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And when it seems like Nothing's going to work out. You better know God makes everything work out for the glory of God. Moses dies on the top of Mount Nebo. The Lord says you can look in, but you can't go in. The people were afraid. God buried Moses in a land that man knew not of so they wouldn't dig him up and worship him. Young Joshua comes into the land. The priests walk across the Jordan River in its swelling season and when their feet hit the water carrying the ark of the presence of God the Bible says that the waters parted hither and thither and they walked through on dry ground and they walked into a land 
that was about to flow in unbelievable ways of milk and honey. And the enemy said, there's too many enemies for you to be able to defeat. Go back to Egypt. And God said to Joshua, fear not, I am with you as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. Be not dismayed. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that I have written therein. And then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. God always gets the last word. He always gets the last word. Judges went crazy for 21 chapters. But when you get to chapter 16, you read 14 times. And the Spirit of God came mightily upon him. And you better know in this day in which every man does right in his own eyes that God is marking people with the spirit of heaven in the supernatural realm and we're going to rise up and do exploits for our God. Ruth came along. Husband died. Runs around with Naomi, her mother-in-law, her other sister-in-law, left, Orpah, went back to a Moabite nation, which I remind you, the Moabites were born in a cave out of an ancestral drunken relationship with Lot and his daughters. Nothing was ever said good about them. And a Moabitess woman came out and went to Israel. And a man named Boaz adopted her into the family. And in the midst of a famine, when the enemy said, you're just a Moabite chick, you have nothing here to offer the Israeli nation. Go back home to the Moabites. The Bible says, blessed be the Lord, which had not left thee this day without a kinsman that his name may be famous in Israel. That his name may be famous in Israel. And then things begin to change. They go from judges to kings. Saul screwed that whole thing up. But David was going to rectify and right the ship. Little kid bringing cheese and Mountain Dew to his brothers one day. Here's a 10 foot tall giant in the middle of a valley saying, I defy the armies of God. And the enemy told everybody from the politicians down to the priests, there's no way you'll ever defeat this guy. He's been eating people like you in prison since he was five years old. He's too big to kill. David said, get over yourself. He's too big to miss. And when the enemy said, there's no way, God always gets the last word. And in 1 Samuel 17, 46, the Bible says, This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and I will take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host to the, of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. Fee, fa, fo, fum. God gets the last word. The battle is the Lord's. You're going down today, Philistine. You're going down today. And it's exactly what began to transpire. Second Samuel. Things look pretty bleak in the kingdom. David numbers the people. The judgment of God falls on the land. David repents, goes to the threshing floor of a man named Ornan. He says, I need to make a sacrifice to the Lord, which, by the way, was the spot that the temple would be built on years later by his son. And Ornan said, well, holy smokes, you're the king of basically the whole world. You can have anything you want. And David could have left it at that and walked away, but he said, neither will I offer unto the Lord my God of that which does cost me nothing. And from that moment, the revival in the nation of Israel began because you will never get the fire to fall unless you offer an expensive sacrifice for it to get here. 
Elijah jumps on the scene in 1 Kings. Ahab and Jezebel, the Clintons of the Old Testament, <laughs> wicked and corrupt to the core. Dogs wouldn't even finish eating her up when old Jehu threw her out a window, bust her wide open. Same thing happened with Ahab. His blood rolls out of the chariot just like the men of God said it was going to happen. But he stands at the base of Mount Carmel. He got 850 false prophets. And the enemy said, Woo! What about it, magic man? What you going to do now? The government's against you. The politicians are, the priests are against you. The prophets are against you. And that woman up there with all that makeup on, she can't stand you. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, the man of God prayed 54 words after they prayed for 12 hours. You see, you can scream to a false god your whole life and get no fire, but you can whisper 54 words to the true God of heaven. And the Bible said, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the sacrifice, licked up the water that was in the trench, and the glory of God fell on that mountain. And the Israelites fell on their face and said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And when the devil says the prophets of Baal are going to take over, Elijah shows up and God gets the last word. Then Elisha shows up, takes the job from his main pastor, and the associate becomes the lead pastor. He goes out and he does twice as many miracles, has twice the power of God, prophesies, predicts things twice as much. God blesses him. Matter of fact, he's so powerful that when he dies, somebody throws somebody's body inside the tomb and it touched his bones, and the Bible said he revived. Came back to life again. This guy had some power in life and in death. And the king found out that Elisha had prophesied against him. Because you hear me, all true prophets of God don't care what people think about them, including political dignitaries, because I bow to an audience of one, and it's not you. And the servant walked out on the porch, and the enemy said, Look at all of those soldiers here to kill you and your boss. This is going to be good. Well, it got to the servant. He poured his coffee out, got sick at his stomach, walked in. He said, hey, man of God, we got not a problem. We got thousands of them up here in the mountain. And the enemy said, you about to die, Elisha. I told you, you should have never got ordained as a prophet to begin with. And he walks out on the porch and he looks around and he says, fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And the Lord opened the eyes of the servant and he saw the chariots of fire and the hosts of angels there to protect him. And when the enemy says, you're going down, there's too many people against you. There's too much talk. There's too much slander. You better know I'm going to pour myself an extra cup of coffee. I'm going to bow my back and say, there are more with us than there are with them because the angels will always protect the people of God. Then you get into First Chronicles and start losing your mind. This one begat this one, and this one begat this one, and this one begat 72 more just like them. And then you have what we heard a month ago, right in the middle of all of it. Name, 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 name. Date, 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 date. What, 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 what? And Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast and that thine hand might be with me and that thou wouldest keep me from evil that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. And God granted him that which he requested because when the enemy gets loud, the word gets louder. Second Chronicles rolls around. The people are in need of a temple. It took them seven years to build it, 13 years to build Solomon's house, 20 years to go by. 
After seven years, the house is filled with gold and silver. The Bible says that silver in Israel was like stones in a riverbed. It was in such abundance. It looked like there would be no institution of a sacrificial system. They were going to stay in a, in a tent, in a tabernacle on the backside of a desert somewhere for the rest of their life. And Solomon said, oh, no, 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 no. My father gave me the offering. God gave me the wisdom. And for seven years, he built the temple of God. He sent out an executive order amongst all of the kingdom. The place was packed and jammed. People sitting on the edge of their seat with bated breath. You'd never seen such a crowd. No microphone system, no screens, fog machines, or skinny jeans. Just the glory of God. The Bible said that he, he built a, a little platform, kind of like this one. And he stood on the platform, got on his knees, and the king, the wisest and richest man in the world, he lifted up his hands and he began to call out to God in front of the presence of all the people. And after years of no temple, after expenses beyond anything you and I could ever fathom to imagine, the enemy was saying, there will never be a day that the glory of God ever resides in Israel like it did under your father, David. It just won't happen. And in Second Chronicles, Seven and one, it says, now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house and the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And then God said, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Then there's a crazy priest who is a scribe by the name of Ezra that got so buck wild mad at the religious tomfoolery of the people of God, the Bible said he stood on top of a pulpit of wood and pulled his hair out. And I feel like that sometimes as a pastor. <laughs> Woo, dear God, don't you get it? That's where you get the phrase, I'm going to pull my hair out. Well, he did. People had come against them. It didn't look like anything was going to be rebuilt. Ezra 3 and verse 11, God begins to speak. The people begin to respond. And they sang together by chorus in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in their midst. And when the enemy says, God will never do it, God always has the last word. Nehemiah stood on top of a wall for 52 miraculous days of a supernatural building program. They said not only should it not be done, it'll never be done in 50 years. He said God will do it in 52 days. They had a, a masonry tool in one hand and a sword in the other. And all of these evil people began to come against him. And he said, hey, you need to come off the wall, Nehemiah. We want to meet you over in this sanctuary in the plains of Ono. But the Bible says he knew that they thought and prophesied mischief against him. And they said, meet us in Ono. And he looked down and said, oh, no. And you better learn to say no to oh no when the devil starts whispering in your ears that your kid's never going to come back, that your marriage is never going to get better, that you're always going to be broke and sick and bankrupt. You better know. you got to say no to oh no. I'm doing a great work and I can't come off the wall. And when the enemy said, you're done, it was finished in 52 days. And he said in Nehemiah 18, neither be ye sorry for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Then this little girl got raised up in the kingdom. King Artaxerxes fired his wife because he was a pervert and she wouldn't strip and dance in front of him and his buddies. So he said, all right, Vashti's got to go. I need a new queen. Little girl named Esther walks on the scene. Prettiest thing in the whole kingdom, Bible said. A beautiful young virgin. 
He had all these women get dolled up, get this, for a year. Sometimes we think, you know, women are a little bit too much. This guy was too much. He, he had them doll up for six months and then for the next six months bathe in oil and spices so when they walked in, they smelled like a bed, bath, and beyond. <laughs> I mean, these chicks were like living Yankee candles. <laughs> and when Esther walked in, that aroma, she started giving off. He's like, that's a looker right there. Put a crown on her head. Mordecai said, I think I'm going to kill all the Jews. He had no idea that she was one. You know the story. The enemy said, Mordecai, butcher them all. Butch or Haman, butcher them all. Mordecai found out about it. He rent his clothes. Mordecai was the uncle of Esther. He said, hey, you're going to have to do something about it. Haman's going to kill all of us. This guy's crazy. Now, you know what happened at the end of the story, don't you? Because I'm going to tell you something right now. You hear me and you hear me well. When people build something to hang you, you better look out because God will let them hang themselves every single time. So Esther said, if I go before the king and he doesn't hold out his golden scepter, I'm going to die, Mordecai. I'm going to die. He said, well, everybody's going to die because of Haman. What difference does it make? And the enemy said, to her, much like he said to many of us, it's too dangerous. You keep your church open during a pandemic and people are going to laugh at you. Try to burn your building down. Nobody's going to show up. You're going to be responsible for white-sheeted corpses in the Walmart parking lot. You Adolf Hitler wannabe. You, you, you can't do that. You can't stand up and be bold. And she said, ah, oh, wow, let me tell you something. Mordecai, I just, I just don't know if I can fight this battle. He said, let me tell you something. If you don't, the Jews' deliverance will come from someone else. But who knoweth whether thou art coming to the kingdom for such a time as this? And the enemy said, Esther, Sit down. And Esther stood up and said, If I perish, I perish. And save the nation to this day. And they still celebrate the Feast of Purim. For when God hung the hangers. Job had all of his buddies come against him. They said, look at you. You got to have sin in your life. You ain't paying your taxes. You absconded with money. You sleep around with women. You're looking at porn. What's up? The Bible said they sat down and looked at him for seven days. The enemy literally said to God, let me touch his body. Let, let me kill him. God said, you can do anything you want to, but don't kill him. And don't kill his wife either because they too shall be one flesh. So leave her out of it. And she nagged him to death. But nonetheless... The Bible has a very interesting phrase in Job chapter number one. And while he was yet talking, and while he was yet talking, and while he was yet talking, when one order of bad news came, worse news came on the heels, worse news came on the heels, then his friends showed up and didn't open their mouth for seven days. And when they did, he wished to God he'd have never known them. They accused him of being everything but Job himself. And the enemy said, yeah, you know you're wrong. You know you're wicked. God has forsaken you. Your friends have forsaken you. He said, my breath is strange unto my wife. That's a man sleeping on the couch. That's the facts. And the enemy said, you down, we ring in the bell, you out. And Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And the Lord blessed Job in the latter end of his life more than that of the first. God always gets the last word no matter what the enemy tells you. Yeah. Psalms is a pretty bleak book. David prayed against his enemy so much, kept him awake at night. He's confessing this, confessing that, praying in precatory psalms. He's like, God, rip their tongues out, stomp on their heads, crack their skulls. Let's sing that next Sunday, praise God. Right? 
kill them all, Lord. Crush their skulls, Lord. Hallelujah. Rip out their tongues. May their bank be desolate. Make them so they can't pay their bills. Right? That's what he was singing. This guy had more people come against him than you can shake a stick at. And the enemy said, lay down the crown and be done. He said, I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me round about because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still water. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runs over. As for God, his way is perfect. He is a shield and a buckler to all them that put their trust in him. The righteousness of the name of God is a safe tower. And the righteous run into it and they're safe. You see, God always gets the last word. Book of Wisdom jumps in on us. 31 chapters of the craziest levels of wisdom you've ever imagined. Coming out of the mouth of a man that was fighting more hell by the acre than you can ever imagine. And the enemy says, oh well, in Proverbs don't mean nothing. Nothing important about that, just skip over that, don't worry about all that nonsense Greg Locke talking about read your Bible, read your Bible. Proverb a day, keep a devil away. That's the enemy. But the word of the Lord is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. God, I don't know what to do. I do. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Honor the Lord with the first fruits of all thy substance. And so shall thou have increase and thy barn shall burst asunder. God always gets the last word. Then the fiery preacher Solomon writes a book called Ecclesiastes. And oh, what a book it is. And he writes this whole book and says, life's crazy. Life's full of problems. Life's full of stumbling along like a blind man. Trial and error. Happenstance and chance. Nothing new under the sun. Life without God is vanity. And the enemy agreed with every bit of it. Yep. Life is vain. But the word of God always gets the final say. Because he brings his book to a conclusionary moment and says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. And keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And the devil's like, mm, dag nabbit. Because the word of God always has the final say. Song of Solomon jumps on us. Married people say amen. Single people, we'll talk about it later. And God says, let me tell you how much I love you. Set me as a seal upon thine heart. As a seal, a marking upon thine arm, for love is cruel as death, and jealousy is cruel as the grave, which a man therefore would give all that he has for love, and it would utterly be condemned. And in that entire passage, here's what God says. When everybody hates you, you are the bride. I love you. You are my wife. And I will treat you with respect and dignity. Because the word of God gets the last say even in Song of Solomon. Oh, Isaiah comes along and for five chapters he didn't know what to do but whoa, everybody. Whoa, 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 whoa. Did I say whoa, whoa? Whoa. And his whoa was wow. He pronounced so much judgment on them people. I mean, he had these people quivering and shaking in their boots. The judgment of God was about to fall but not before the glory of God did. And the enemy says, Isaiah, you do realize you're like the most hated guy on YouTube right now, right? Won't you just sit down and hush? If you can't say nothing nice, say nothing at all, Isaiah. 
And Isaiah walks out of that moment of discouragement from the devil. And he walks into a vision. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one having six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried and said to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the temple moved at the voice of him that spake, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the glory of the Lord God. God of hosts and the whole book changed because God gets the last word. God gets the final word. And then we move over to a weeping prophet who cried not from a pulpit but from a prison cell three times. Three times. And when he's down there in that pit of despair, and the kings and princes and noblemen have spit on him and left him to die. And the enemy says, see what happens when you tell the truth? You'd been better off like the rest of them Israeli prophets and just lie to them so you could at least get your bills paid. And like all preachers, he starts believing that foolishness. And the Lord comes down in that pit and says, before I form thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever thou shalt say, I will give it to you, so that you shall speak it. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Behold, I have sent you to tear down, to pull down, to build up, and to plant, saith the Lord God Almighty, because if you call unto me I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not get out of the pit church because God gets the last word he goes on and he writes a funeral dirge called the book of lamentations whole thing could be written with a spooky organ sound behind it it was about death and right in the middle of it here's what the word says the Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh for him. Ezekiel gets caught up in a vision of God, sees things for 48 chapters he could barely even write about. We try to explain stuff that he even said himself under inspiration I can't figure out. The secret things belong unto the Lord. God won't tell everybody his secrets. He's right in the midst of some craziness and God said, let me tell you why I've raised you up for such a time as this. Why you have come to the nation of Israel. Why you are to predict and prophesy judgment of God and glory of God on the nation of Judah. Let me tell you why you should do this because the enemy kept saying, listen man, you got too much going on Ezekiel. These people hate you. God told you to, to preach buck naked. And then all of a sudden, he gets caught up in a vision, and here's what God says. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die if thou dost not Speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, Ezekiel, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his own iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. The enemy said, you are a wash up. God said, you are a watchman. Stand and call them to repentance. Stand and call them to repentance. And that's exactly what the man of God did. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, my shack, your shack, and a bungalow, they get called before King Nebuchadnezzar. 
The king said, you see that furnace? I'm going to crank it up seven times harder than it's ever been heated before. And the enemy, no doubt, said to them, y'all done got yourself in a big fat mess now, hillbillies. What you got to say for yourself? You better fall down and worship everybody else when that banjo music starts. You better fall down and you better worship that statue. And all three of them consorted together, locked arms, locked shields in the spirit realm, looked at big old mean king in the face and said, O king, live forever. We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve thy gods and he will deliver us from you. Listen, I've heard of astronauts. I've heard of juggernauts. But I want to pastor a whole tent full of we will nots. We will not serve this culture. We will not bow down to a false gods. We will not serve thy gods, Babylon. We will not. We will not. So then Hosea jumps in the, in the ring. I thought about preaching a sermon one time called, You Want Me to Marry a What? <laughs> you want me to marry a what? God said, marry a prostitute. Why would he do that? I'll tell you why. Because God used physical problems to express spiritual problems that could only have a spiritual solution. And he said, let me tell you something, Israel. Just like Hosea the prophet married a hooker, you've hooked your way out of my good graces because you have prostituted yourself to the nations and demon gods of the world. And I mean Hosea, 14 chapters. It's rich, like crazy rich. She ran off home and, and, and hoard around some more. And then God said, take her back, have babies with her. Whew. That's a tough dude right there. I mean, she hooked and crooked him on a couple of occasions. But right in the middle of the whole book, it seemed like everything was going to be bad and, and God's like sitting up on his throne a little bit. And he's getting ready to cast it all down. And the word of God gets the final say. And Hosea fell out before an adulterous nation and said, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. And the God of heaven forgave them because when the enemy says, No revival on the horizon, God always gets the final word. Joel jumps in. It's a book of, if you think Greg Locke's bold, read Joel. It justifies me in so many ways. Makes me look like Ronald McDonald with a microphone. And right in the midst of all of it, I mean the, the locust and the caterpillar and the canker worm had come and eat up the vegetation and the crops of the people of God. They were starving. The ground had no rain. It was like a parched piece of leather. And then all of a sudden, the man of God, filled with the Spirit of God, stands up and says, Thus saith the Lord, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall have visions and on my handmaidens and servants I will pour out of my spirit, saith the Lord. Fulfilled in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, still being fulfilled this morning in this tent with this microphone in my hand. Amos was a farmer. He said, let me tell you crazy people something. I wasn't a prophet or a son of a prophet. I was a herdsman cleaning up sheep poop and growing vegetables for my daddy. And God called me to prophesy to you. And when it seemed like things were never going to get better, 
Joel and Amos were contemporaries. Same stuff going on. It's amazing what happens when you read the Bible chronologically. It starts to make a lot of sense historically. And Amos told the people, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine not of bread, nor of a thirst for water, which they were in one, but of hearing the words of the Lord God Almighty. And he brought them to a place to understand if you don't obey the Bible now, you will never get another chance to do it later. And he brought the people crumbling to their knees and said, you think we're in a famine now? Wait till God takes away his word. And let me say something, America. You better write this very second. Appreciate the Bible in your hand because when they come to take them away, it'll be too late to stand in that day. And when the enemy thinks he has won, God laughs at him. Obadiah is one chapter. There's only four books in the Bible with one chapter. Obadiah happens to be one of them. It's not even a long chapter. But it is a fall down a flight of steps book. It doesn't have anything positive in it for the most part. Because he was sick of their tomfoolery and their nonsense. But even in the midst of judgment, God reserves wrath and remembers mercy. And Obadiah closes it, his entire diatribe to these people by saying, And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. The people had no reason to believe that God was going to do what God was going to do. And the man ends the book and says, let me tell you something. God gets the final word. Jonah goes to the Ninevites and says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's pretty dismal. You got 40 days to repent, get right with God, or he's going to burn the whole place to the ground. I ain't playing. You hear me? Eight words for three days. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Over and over and over and over and over. It's a, it's a horrible book. God was going to judge them all. And when the enemy said, goodbye, Ninevites, God's going to destroy every last one of you. They repented, put on sackcloth and ashes, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented himself of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. And he gave them a 150-year historical revival because God always gets the last word. Micah is one of the most overlooked prophets and passages in the Bible. But right in the middle of everything being politically chaotic, God said, unto the people in that area through Micah, but thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, out of thee shall come forth the ruler of my nation Israel. Nahum is a book of nothing but judgment. Nahum, Nahum, however you say it, it means one thing, God ain't happy. And right in the middle of the Lord God Almighty judging these people, it seemed like it was over with. Nobody would breathe another breath. The Lord is slow to anger. He's great in power. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. Habakkuk had the same problem. Nobody would listen. Habakkuk said the judgment of God is about to fall. Why? Because the mountains shall see thee and they shall tremble in thy presence. And when the devil tries to affright you, you better know that he even trembles at the majesty of the God that sits upon his throne right now. And God always gets the final word. Zephaniah the prophet jumps in and says, and I quote, I will deliver you and I will turn back your captivity from your enemies, saith the Lord of hosts. In the midst of slavery and bondage, 
God said, stop listening to the lies of the enemy. I'm going to show up, show out, and deliver my people like I said I would. Haggai comes along. God says prophetically through this man of God in the midst of horrendous political situations. Sound familiar? Here's what God says. I will shake the heavens and the earth. And I, saith the Lord, will overthrow the thrones of the kingdoms. So you let me tell you something. I'll have my involvement, but it matters not who gets voted in or steals their way into the White House. The Lord shall stand up in righteous judgment, get the final word, and say, I am in control of all the thrones of all the kingdoms. Because every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, every tongue shall fall and cast their crowns at the feet of the Lamb and say, Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy. Well... If you're counting, you've got two books left. Some of y'all thinking, oh, dear Lord, is he going to go through the New Testament? <laughs> In restaurants, stay up all day. I'm not. <laughs> I had an assignment this morning, and this was it. That's all God would give me. That's all I had time to write down. I got more chicken scratching papers up here than you can shake a stick. I got my Bible marked all over the place. And uh, ironically enough, God's given me most of it just to quote. It's been crazy. It's been crazy. But old Zechariah shows up. Nobody likes him because you're like almost done with the Old Testament. You're like, 14 chapters? Come on, Zach. <laughs> but he's there, and he's there for a reason. And he ends his whole book by talking about what all the nations one day will say after they tried to come against the nation of Israel, which will never be destroyed, God prophetically says so. Every nation that comes against Israel ends up in a historical sewer dump, including this one if we ever turn on them. That's a prophetic fact. But he said the people of the earth will come to Israel, and in that day you shall proclaim holiness unto the Lord. Because I don't care what the political climate looks like or the religious climate. God always gets the last word. And then you get to Malachi. Oh, Malachi was a strange prophet. People don't like Malachi because he talked about tithing. And it makes non-tithers uncomfortable. But it blesses those of us that do what the Bible says. The rest of you can live under a curse of poverty all you want to, but I'm not going to. Somebody shout amen before I get to preaching on generosity in this house. But he didn't end his book with tithing or poverty. He ended his book with a prophecy. Because Israel was about to go through 400 years of silence from God. Did you know when you finish the book of Malachi and you start the book of Matthew in the New Testament, there's a little page there, a little blank page, that divides the two testaments, the two covenants of God from law to grace. That page illustrates exactly what God said for 400 years. Not a thing. No prophets. No tongues, no miracles, no signs, no deliverance, no wonders, no physical Jesus. It was the dark ages of Bible history. Not a word from heaven for 400 long, lonely, dark, incredibly judgmental years. And just before it happened, Malachi says, I need to remind you of something that will happen. It's going to be a ways off, but it's going to happen because God always gets the final word. And Malachi says, and he shall turn 
the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. And he said, thus saith the Lord, it's going to happen and it will. He closes the Old Testament chronologically and God zips his mouth and stays his hand for 400 years and the devil runs loose like a wild coyote on the backside of the desert recognizing what he thinks to be victory he shakes his fist in the face of God for 400 years and destroys humanity and they plunge into 400 years of debauchery religious degradation and disobedience not a prophet on the earth not a word from a bible not a dream given from the holy ghost silence silence so loud that history still hears its roar. And after 400 years, the enemy said, <laughs> well, got what I wanted. God finally hushed. The people are crazy. They ain't had a word from God in 400 stinking years. Okay, sirrah, sirrah. But how many know God always gets the last word? And in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It was the same John that was called forth to prepare, prepare, prepare the way of the Lord. And when the world lost its mind, God in the form of a baby sent forth heaven's redemption and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins the devil slick that will minimize his power but I do maximize his And I know whatever one of them books say from Matthew to Revelation. But God just told me to deal with the first 39 books of the Bible today. Because no matter what happens this year and next, if Jesus tarry, there'll be a supernatural hero that shows up on the scene by the name of the Antichrist one day. And he'll roll up his diabolical sleeves and the Bible says he has one goal and it's not political domination. It's the destruction of the saints of God. And that demise has begun prophetically. And he's going to come against the church. He's going to kill God's people. The Bible says it. Whether you believe that or not is of no concern to me. You better be ready. Get some oil in your lamp because it's about time to shine bright in the darkness. And the Bible says predictively, we're not even there yet, predictively, prophetically, the Antichrist shall stand up and make himself God, knowing that he's not, and shall badger and berate and behead the people of God. And it's coming to a town near you, you better get ready for it. And even prophetically, the devil thinks, I've got this superhero. I've got a beast and a false prophet. And God says, let me tell you what you ain't got. Because in the midst of us getting our heads cut off, God says, Ch -ch -ch. and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony 
and they love not their lives unto the death. And you better know when the enemy thinks he has won, God always gets the final word. Thus saith the Lord. Shout in this house if you believe that God gets the final say. Some of you feel like your promise has been too long in the waiting. Why don't you leave your seat right now and come to the steps of this altar and say, God, I'm going to believe your word for my prodigal son. I'm going to believe your word for my addiction. I'm going to believe your word for my finances, for my sickness, for this infirmity, for my deliverance. I'm going to believe your word that I'm going to get that job I've been praying about. I'm going to believe your word that I have authority over demons. I can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I'm going to believe your word that when the world goes dark, the church church is going to shine bright. I'm going to believe you. 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 Weep it out before the Lord in his presence today. I don't care what the enemies told you, what the cultures told you, what the world told you, or what you have told you. God gets the final word. In every book of the Bible, thus saith the Lord, thus saith just pray, press in, spend time with him. If you're here today for baptismal celebration, my right, your left, head over that way. Miss Billy's there. The crew's there. We'll get you a name tag. We'll get you a towel. We'll get you what you need. We've got little changing rooms. If you've, if you've ever been saved, your very next step, your next step is water baptism. That's what the Bible teaches. That's the first level and area of obedience in your life. So listen, we never officially dismiss. We just say, we'll see you the next service. Tonight, it happens to be at 6 o'clock, first Sunday of the month. We got deliverance and healing tonight. Don't miss out. If you've never been to one of our deliverance services, I'm telling you, get here. If you have, get somebody here that's in torment and needs help from the demonic. So you pray as long as you want. You stay as long as you want. You hug. You worship. You watch the baptismal celebrations. If you've got to slip out, you slip out. We go long in our church. We don't apologize for it. If you need to go, you go. We, we don't ever say you're dismissed. We just say, you know, right now, the Lord's doing in people's lives what he wants to do. So you stay if you need to. You slip out if you need to. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. The worship team is going to press in, sing. The wife's going to pray whatever the Lord tells her. I'm going to go to the baptismal tank, do some baptismal celebrations. But listen, I'm telling you right now, don't you ever forget this message that God always gets the final word. You may be down, but you are not out. The bell has not rung. And a just man falls seven times, but he gets up again because God has the final word. Shout amen, church. Worship with us.